Representative Diaz's bill, um, 7374, which codifies the policy of the Council of, on Post-Secondary Education, which identifies uh, individuals exempt from paying out-of-state tuition. Representative Diaz, Dr. Purcell, um, is it, and Stephanie Geller. Representative, welcome back. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, again. And thank you, members, for your patience and allow us to introduce the House Bill 7374 for 11 time in the state of Rhode Island by Representative Grace Diaz. Proudly to do that. <laughs> and I'm so pleased that when I started introducing this bill, it was around eight states that allow allowing students to get access to college. Right now, you know how many are? 20. 60 of them are granted by the legislature and four of them by the Board of Higher Education. And when I was reading the list of states that are allowing uh, undocumented students have it, has access to the same state to issue, I was surprised by the state, and I want to read it quick, quick, because that maybe uh, bring, you, bring to you another level of who are working in, in the entire country. Arkansas, California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Maryland, Nebraska, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Texas, Utah, Washington, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. Um, I was surprised, honestly, and uh, I also I was so happy and excited to see the name of Rhode Island and the list of the four states that are allowing students to go to college and pay the same tuition. And thank to Governor Chafee, who had the courage in 2008 or 9, I don't recall exactly, and copy and paste the legislation that, are, that we are working for so many years. So far, we have around 100 students get the benefit of go to college and pay by their own uh, resources, their education. And I'm so happy that we can see the transition between an undocumented students go to college, finish their school, and at the time, some of them able to have the legal status in the state of Rhode Island. And that's just because we allow them to have access to education. Today, I will, um, it's another year that I'm persisting to introduce the legislation again because I think it's the fair thing to do that. Uh, I like to see in my lifetime the opportunity to secure the opportunity to students. And I was talking with Terry Goldman, my good friend, during those years, and we become very close friends. I also asked for gay married. Because we are working, argue, happy, all the things that sometimes happen in the Mary uh, regarding to this bill. And I know he will touch a few things that I want to touch before, like any household between men and women. And one thing that he will mention is that uh, he will say probably, let's wait for the federal government to decide that. But the federal law don't prohibit any state to address those issues and not prohibit it to then to uh, put in place in a state tuition. Um, and also, I was so surprised to see many states that also provide tuition assistance so, to some um, students. Uh, I'm very pleased that I'm, I have uh, the company of experts and people who witness the great opportunities some students have in Rhode Island. And um, as I was doing my research, I also noticed that most of the states that passed the legislation, they required three years of high, in high school in order to qualify, in order to uh, have the opportunity to have access to the same state tuition. And some of them only require one year. Uh, things that really surprised me. So the United States is moving forward. Education need to be the first thing that legislators need to address and put in place. Regardless of immigration or not, I believe every student in Rhode Island need to have access to higher education. And I hope my colleagues at some point 
to agree with me and help me to pass this legislation, even though it's a policy and we allow them to get in, into college and working hard to pay one, two, three credits per semester. I'm afraid that at some point we can have a governor who get rid of other policies. So the only way they can be secure is if we decided to pass the legislation. And we no federal comments. I would like to give you the opportunity to my colleague who's grateful to be with us today. Thank you. Yeah, this is really a simple bill. To, to me, it, it codifies what has been passed and been put in policy at our uh, the council level for several years. Um, it hasn't brought in a, a large influx of students. We want to encourage more. Um, we believe that it actually enhances the provisions by ask, adding a, a confidential component to it, but other, the other components are very much identical to what currently exists in practice in this state. Um, I want to go back to the thing when we talked about uh, Westerly, about building human capital and how important you needed to have that happen. The futurist... Uh, in several books have talked about you want to educate the people that are going to be in your community and that you shouldn't necessarily worry so much about the people that are going to skyrocket and go off to uh, fancy schools, but the ones that are going to stay here. And these uh, individuals are those who are going to be your economy, and we need to make sure we invest in them so that they can um, be a greater contributors to um, what makes Rhode Island great. Um, hi again, I'm Stephanie Geller from Rhode Island Kids Count. I'll be fairly brief. Um, I've uh, turned in written testimony as well, and I think I haven't been here for quite as many as 11 years, but I think Rhode Island Kids Count's been supporting this bill um, for several years, probably 11, and I myself for at least five or six of those, and was happy to be one of the people testifying in support of the um, of the, the policy passing um, the Rhode Island um, um, Board of Regents of Higher Education in 2011. Um, and we, too, agree it's, a t it's time to, to codify this regulation in law. Um, we've, we've had a chance to see how it's being implemented. Um, I think there are probably a number of students behind me who can talk a little bit more about the implementation. But um, I think um, Grace Diaz gave a very nice overview of um, the other states that have such laws. Um, there, I have a, a, at least one copy of the... Um, of the NCSL um, overview of this issue. If anyone wants me to leave it, I'd be happy to um, with information about other states' laws as well as information that I mentioned in my um, testimony about a March 2011 report from the American Association of State Colleges and Universities that looked a little bit deeper into the, um, the outcomes of these kinds of laws in different states and found that it doesn't, it doesn't in fact, deprive states of revenue, um, but, in fact, increases revenue for states because it encourages students to attend college who otherwise wouldn't have been able to. So it's a revenue enhancer, not a revenue depleter. Um, it also talks about... Um, challenges that have come up um, in terms of core challenges and that no challenge has currently has been upheld. So I don't think there's a concern around that. And we've had a chance to see how this, how this is being implemented at the regulation level for a number of years. Um, we had data only as far back, only as recent as um, fall of 2013, saying there were 74 students who were um, being positively impacted by this, uh, by this regulation. Um, and we really encourage you to put this into law and um, encourage your, your support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. Chairman, before I move, I just want to uh, suggest one little change in page, page in second, the second page. Yeah, the second page, um, line 11. That bill was written a long time ago, and a few changes have been done. Instead, the Rhode Island Board of Education now is the Council of Post-Secondary Education. And I have a suggestion to give it to the clerk. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank Any you. questions before the representative and the commissioner leave? And Stephanie. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you for staying. Have a busy night here tonight. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, is it Rodrigo? Okay. And how about. Um, oh, oh, boy. I have to wipe my glasses on. I apologize to call some nam more names here. Um, is it Yasser, Yasser, or or, or Dante? Uh, how about the uh, Saban, Adrian, Chris Coughlin? Uh, Lillian Sapino. Good evening, sir. If you wanted to begin. Good evening. 
My name is Rodrigo Pimentel. I am here on behalf of Jobs with Justice in support of H7374. I am an undocumented immigrant. I have lived in East Providence for practically my entire life, having moved here from Portugal when I was merely 10 months of age. Last year, I graduated from East Providence High School. One of the classes I enjoyed and learned from the most was the AP U.S. History course. As they say, the point of history is to learn from it by not repeating our mistakes. Unfortunately, however, I see our nation repeating the same nativist attacks and anti-immigrant um, sentiment that is an ugly part of our history. And when we look back upon our history, we see different groups that were marginalized and scapegoated for our nation's problems. The oppressors will appeal to the law, often stating that the law is the law. They will hold the law as sacrosanct, as many have unfortunately done in our past. For instance, during slavery, where in a way slaves would break the law by attempting to illegally cross the Mason-Dixon line. And the Quakers and abolitionists also knowingly violated the law by helping them. And it was the white slave owners that made it against the law to help runaway slaves. And after Reconstruction failed, whites complained of black migration to the city, using similar rhetoric we see today, accusing them of taking their jobs, bringing down their wages, and stating they were, they were too culturally different to assimilate. And today, we have a demagogue who comes along and says, I know what the causes of your problems are. It's the immigrants. It's the Muslims. But it wasn't so long ago when it was the uppity women who were trying to take the jobs away from men or the blacks who were trying to take the jobs away from whites. That's what demagoguery is about. It is to dehumanize, disenfranchise, and discriminate, all to obfuscate the real problems facing our society. Let's talk about those problems. For all of us, tuition rates have been increasing astro astronomically. Working families are struggling to send their children to college as they work longer hours as their wages stay the same. I am in one of those working families. My dad is an immigrant, a small business owner who provides jobs in his community. I have worked at the Portuguese consulate. I have worked in political campaigns. And throughout my career, I have worked legally and I have contributed my fair share of taxes. And yet, there are some who wish to deny my family the opportunity to send their child to college. And at the University of Rhode Island, out-of-state tuition would mean an additional cost of over tens of thousands of dollars per year, an unfair and unjust burden. We are Rhode Islanders and Americans as much as you and your families are. We are all trying to make a better life while contributing economically to this great state of ours. We solve this problem by rejecting demagoguery. We solve the problem now, if the committee wishes, by rejecting political expediency and being on the right side of history. By doing such, the committee will show that human dignity is what is sacrosanct, not blind appeals to the law. I urge the committee to vote for passage and to follow the lead of the 16 other states that have passed similar laws. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you please hold your applause? Uh, we want to get through the testimony here, so it just disrupts us. Okay. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Sabine Adrian, and I'm an organizer for the Providence Student Union. I'm actually going to read a testimony from a high school student um, in our program. My name is Diane Gonzalez. I'm a senior at Central High School, and I support Bill H7374. I'm a delegate of the Providence Student Union. We are a group of young activists who fight and stand up for what is right, especially concerning our education. I was amazed to find out that undocumented students who want to go to college are not guaranteed in-state tuition, even if they've lived and grown up in Rhode Island as students alongside the rest of us throughout elementary, middle, and high school. When you give some students a more affordable option for college and block others from that, that is discrimination. We all go through the same struggle of high school. Why would you allow putting up an extra barrier for some students to attend college? Undocumented students have struggled so much and have to work so hard just to have some of the things that we enjoy. And despite all of that, many of them still succeed and emerge as leaders. Some of the leaders in our organization, PSU, are undocumented high school students, but that doesn't stop them from being important leaders in our schools. They would be a valuable addition to any college or university. Often undocumented students even have, a, have an even stronger passion for getting an education than the rest of us because they haven't always had the privilege of a stable education. If this bill doesn't pass, you're telling me that some of my classmates don't deserve an equal chance to go to college. We call this country the land of opportunity. And in that spirit, I ask you to give my classmates a fair chance at getting an education 
um, pass Bill H7374 and give all students of Rhode Island in-state tuition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, welcome. Hi, uh, good evening, my name is um, Liliana um, San Pedro and I'm gonna also read a testimony. Um, there you go. I'm also gonna read a, fellow tes um, a testimony from a fellow student um, who wasn't able to make it today. Um, so, as an undocumented student at Brown, I can vouch for how effective and impactful the DREAM Act has been to those qualified. My parents brought me to the USA when I was only four. They made it very clear that every day I had to work harder than everyone else because I didn't belong. Every day I tell myself this, um, and the only difference now is that now I know this because of DACA, all of my efforts and words won't be silenced or overlooked um, like those of millions of other immigrants. Um, applying to DACA has not only allowed me to pursue an Ivy League education and have work authorization to work on campus um, to relieve some of the financial burden that comes with also being a first generation college student, um, but it has allowed me to gain um, a little more reaffirmation and security that I can use to pursue my American dream. Um, I think everyone should have some stability and security of their right to dream and reach their goals. Please keep my story and those of, other, those of others in mind when making this important decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Representative Mori. Chairman, thank you. I just wanted to assure Rodrigo that his AP U.S. history teacher is proud of his uh, passionate and articulate testimony. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, Rudy Torres, Ana Maria, um, oh, I'm sorry. Anna Maria Mooney's, Ada, uh, I, sorry, I can't even make this lame out, and Viet Nungjin, and okay, how about um, Ivana uh, Cortez Diaz, Claudia Silva, Claudia Silva. Alexis Rodriguez, Roxanne Sanchez, Hillary Davis, Cara Cerbello, Cerbello, Nelson Morales, Eliza uh, Boschetti, Carrie um, Hervea. William Perry, uh, Terry Gorman. Good evening, sir, if you'd like to begin. Sure. <clears throat> uh, good evening, members of the House Finance Committee. Uh, my name is Nelson Morales. I stand here tonight to tell you a quick story that I have experienced. Uh, I'm, a Rhode, I'm a Rhode Islander who... Uh, has lived in this state for about 25 years. I'm currently an intern at Citizens Bank uh, on Sakana Sac Crossroad in Cranston, Rhode Island. Um, I got this opportunity through this program called Year Up. Uh, there are currently some um, interns in this state house right now, and there are plenty of others throughout the state of Rhode Island uh, working for corporate, uh, corporate partners for the program. Um, in this program, I am currently enrolled at CCRI. I have only gotten this opportunity um, because of the DACA, Deferred Action Against Childhood Arrivals. I graduated from Cranston East uh, High School in 2008. That was when reality hit me. Um, I had grown up with the American dream, although I knew of my Guatemalan culture. When I was done with school, it was time to apply for college. I got accepted, but I faced an issue. On my 18th birthday, I was considered an undocumented student and I could not work legally. Spartan College of Aeronautics in Tulsa, Oklahoma had accepted my application, um, but I had to pay an international student tuition to attend, which was very expensive. I spent the next four years working under unlivable circumstances. Um, in 2012, DACA was indicted in the United States. This gave me new hope. During my time, I realized that, that my success was tied uh, with my education. I wanted to attend college, but how can I attend college if I'm paying an out-of-state tuition? I am a Rhode Islander. I have attended school with many of your children. 
I believe I, in, I am entitled to the same rights as any human being and as other students that I grew up with playing on the courtyard of my elementary school. I believe education is the beacon of uh, for a successful future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Perry or Mr. Uh, Gorman, which one do you want to go first? Okay, Mr. Perry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, many members. My name is William Perry. I'm here in opposition. Your, mic, your mic's not on, uh, oh, Sorry. I'm here in opposition to uh, Bill 7374. Uh, this bill is yet another example of what I believe to be a wrong-headed approach to illegal immigration. Our immigration laws state that if you entered the country without permission or overstayed a valid visa, you are deportable. We should and must enforce our immigration laws. Not enforcing those laws has allowed an underclass of residents to inhabit our state and country. This is not good for our country. No aid of any kind ought to be bestowed upon illegal aliens other than that specifically prescribed by law. Anything else serves as an inducement to further in illegal immigration. We must get out of the business of aiding and abetting illegal aliens. America is a country of laws. Some argue that law enforcement, that immigration law enforcement, excuse me, is a federal function. That's just plain hogwash. The truth is that we are all responsible for law enforcement. No law enforcement entity operates in a vacuum. Cooperation from various entities, including our citizens, is necessary for, for law enforcement to work for all of us. Take away that cooperation, and anarchy thrives, such as our present situation with illegal immigration. Immigration law violators openly defy the law and dare us to do something about it. Please answer that challenge and enforce the law. Do not pass H. 7374. Do not aid and abet illegal aliens. Do what is right for your citizens and your country. Giving beyond sense and reason is an American drug. Please think of your citizens and country and just say no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Mr. Gorman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm here in the 11th year. I don't have a ring for, for grace. Yet I can't afford a ring still after 11 years. Uh, but we have, we could be married because we fight so much about this particular issue. But uh, I, just, I have a question on the, to start off on the bill. Why do we insist in the bill it says that it creates the Student Equal Opportunity Act, which would identify those students who are exempt from paying non resident tuition? at public universities, colleges, and community colleges. Why doesn't it say that it provides in-state tuition for illegal alien students? It just, it just seems like after 11 years we could change that, uh, that statement because it, the, the intent of the bill is to give in-state tuition. It's not just to identify the students. So if someone were looking to see this, looked at this bill, they would say, well, I'm not going to go down there for that. They're just going to identify the students tonight. So, but I wish that, that would get cleared up. But the, the, uh, oh, excuse me, the current policy that we have now is against federal law, against federal law. It's against three federal laws. If we codify this into law, it's still going to be against two federal laws. And one of the federal laws that I believe Grace was quoting, saying that the United States gives states permission to give in-state tuition, or they're not against it, what that law says is a state cannot give or can give in-state tuition to illegal alien students, providing that they provide the same benefit to any student from any state, regardless of their state of residence. 
first before we can provide that. So that, that those other states, the other 16 states are still in, in violation of that law. I maintain, and everyone disagrees, but that this increases the amount of illegal aliens that will come to Rhode Island. It's, a, it's an additional incentive, and it enhances our reputation as a sanctuary state, whether anyone believes that or not. And one example of us being a sanctuary state, and I don't know, I've, I've sent all sorts of information out. Since 2011, we've had 1,768 babies born to illegal alien mothers in the state of, in the state of Rhode Island. That, to me, is bringing in more illegal aliens. Also, our state, with its unintended consequences with these bill, this bill, our state has had forced upon us by President Obama 473 unaccompanied alien children since 2013. Almost all of those children are currently in our schools. If you look at the cost of that, those 473 students, it's $11,600,000 a year that we're having to pay for those students that were forced upon us. We didn't invite them in. They're, he they're here, and we're having to deal with them. The superintendent of schools, this is another unintended consequence, the superintendent of schools in Providence recently stated in the Providence Journal that we have to be prepared for a tsunami of need in the ELL programs in the Providence school system. So a tsunami of need is going to, down the road, is going to be a tsunami of need at, the, at our colleges also. And we would lose, and I maintain lose, we wouldn't gain that much money. We would lose $16,000 per year. That's the difference between in-state tuition and out-of-state tuition. So all of these students that potentially could go to URI, CCRI, and Rhode Island College, at least at URI, it would be $16,000 a year the state of Rhode Island wouldn't collect because they're not considered residents of Rhode Island. They're not considered residents of the United States, even though that's what they claim. They're considered illegal aliens. In the bill, on page one, line six and seven, where it exempts students from paying in-state tuition, on line six, uh, eight, nine, and ten, this is a question I've asked several years. Will out-of-state students who have graduated from private high schools, numbers in the hundreds, in Rhode Island be eligible? Schools like Moses Brown, Wheeler, St. Raphael Academy, LaSalle Academy, Hendricken, etc. I'm personally aware of five students from Franklin, Mass., that are currently enrolled in Mount St. Charles. So when they graduate, they still live in Franklin, Mass., but they've graduated from a Rhode Island high school, they attended a Rhode Island high school for more than three years, will they be eligible? Can they ask for that? And also, right now, any out-of-state student could sue the University of Rhode Island if there's a person paying in-state tuition that's an illegal alien because of that law, that 8 U.S.C. 1621. It also says one of the requirements would be to provide an affidavit to the to the college that they're applying for, stating that they intend to become a U.S. citizen or apply as soon as they're eligible. Who is going to take care of that at the college? Who's going to maintain those records? Who's going to find out if that affidavit, are they just going to take somebody's word for it, say, oh, you signed an affidavit, that's okay? And the application for legal status is that's all up in the air if they put that down that they're going to get they're going to become legal as soon as possible and the last thing that I'll say is it's all, all well and good if we were going to give in-state tuition to these students but when they graduate from the University of Rhode Island CCRI or Rhode Island College they still happen to be illegal aliens and they cannot work in the United States of America according to the law. DACA students are different, but the majority of the students aren't DACA students. They cannot work in the United States of America after the we've get granted them that benefit of in-state tuition for four years at one of those colleges.
So with all of those unexpected consequences, I would ask that you vote against this bill, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you all for your testimony. I appreciate it. Um, Is it Caspa Despinoza, Ruth Lopez, Adequa Ba? Hello. Good evening, everybody. Ladies first. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk about my experience. Um, so my family, first of all, my name is Adika. My family was granted withholding of removal in 2006. And um, I was in high school back then. We didn't really think about college. And uh, by the time I graduated, North Providence High School, I attended high school here. Um, I've been in America since I was nine. Okay, so when I got to high school, they asked for my, you know, residence paperwork and stuff, and I didn't have that kind of paperwork to give to them because withholding of removal is basically a temporary residence kind of thing where you're not leaving the United States. You could stay here, you can work here, but you can just stay here. If you leave, you can't come back kind of thing. So that's life for us. We can't go anywhere now. So I wanted to attend attend college. Uh, I went to CCRI, and they asked me for all these paperwork. I didn't have it, so they put me in as an out-of-state student. So I went for one semester, which is $5,000, And uh, my dad was, you know, he's not a wealthy man. He was working, like, in the restaurant at that time in the back. And, I mean, legally. (laughs) Okay. Um, And it was ridiculous because there's six of us, six children. And at that time, it, it seemed very hard. So I had to basically drop that you know, drop that idea of going to college. And uh, my friends actually spoke me into going to Sanford Brown um, Technical School, where I became a pharmacy technician in like nine months or so. I worked for three years because I I was also looking up the DREAM Act, the whole thing, I followed it. Uh, But it didn't look like I can fit in that because that was for illegal immigrants, uh, people who are coming here from, you know, illegally, basically. So I... I waited for that to pass, and it turned out it wasn't something for me. Uh, I worked for three years with CVS, Home Delivery Pharmacy in Lincoln, uh, and finally uh, this year I went back to CCRI and I bugged the administration there so much that they finally looked it up, or somehow they actually put me in as an undocumented student. I don't mind that. I pay 1000 or $2,000 right now versus the $5,000 per semester. I want to become a pharmacist, and $5,000 versus $2,000, it's a huge deal. Uh, So what I am doing here is basically saying that these people, they cannot afford out-of-state tuition when they're living here. And I forgot his name over there, but he's, he's been here since he was like 10 months old. So that makes him a Rhode Islander. He's been here forever, and I think it's his right to go to school paying in-state like I do. And I hope this becomes a law because next year, I don't know, whenever the governor change and this law goes away, am I going to be paying 5000 again? And I seriously considered looking up other schools, and I found out that Florida takes in students who have withholding or removal. And I, being 16, 17 at that time, wanted to go to Florida. Why should I leave Rhode Island to go to school? It's just ridiculous. So basically, that's my success story and process. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I think my mic is on. Yes? Okay. My voice is loud anyway. My name is Ruth Lopez, and I'm a senior researcher at the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University. And um, I, my PhD research is on immigration um, and how it intersects with education. And um, and I've worked with immigrant students for, for a long time, but most importantly, I'm the daughter of formerly undocumented immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. 
Um, and I'm living proof of well, who those babies come, could become uh, when they're born from undocumented immigrants. And so um, I'm here today to sort of share a little bit of my expertise and background, but also to remind folks that we do have a Supreme Court decision called Plyler versus Doe that was passed in 1982 that says that any a child who, regardless of their status, can attend a K public K-12 through schooling for free in this country. And so we have a, a sort of like motto in our country that we say that, you know, every student counts, they can be, you can be whatever you want. I've been here for two hours listening to this motto over and over and over again. Um, but unfortunately, that motto and that message doesn't speak to everyone realistically. And many students realize when they're close to graduating that they have nowhere to go, that they can't go to college. Um, and so this bill, if passed, could provide some security and could and could allow for that teacher that's telling all of their students that they can go to college, that, they, that their message can actually uh, ring true in this state. And so it can provide security in that sense. Amika talked about, like, people not being able to figure out what policy would apply to her. That's actually what I study, um, that these policies um, sometimes are passed and, and nobody really knows how to implement them. So by having this bill, it really creates a permanency to this um, to the um, to be able to help these students and hopefully a stronger implementation of, of such policies and uh, or of a bill like this that could benefit not only this generation of students, but future generations of students. Um, and I want to remind folks, too, that this isn't a monetary benefit that students are receiving. They're actually paying the state money to attend college. And so this is a revenue for the state um, that um, for from, from from the state, and it would also re benefit beyond undocumented students. It, it would benefit any, if we read the, the legislation, it would benefit any student that meets this criteria, including U.S. citizens and U.S. residents that have lived here for three years, attended school for three years, got a college and, and are enrolled in college and can fill out this affidavit. And so this uh, this does fulfill, this is not in, in uh, conflict with any federal law. Um, and it would join the other, it's written in a way uh, that the other state bills are also written. And I just want to close with a short story. I used to work with um, und many students, including undocumented students, and um, one of my students in Texas um, benefited from the in-state tuition bill there, where they also have access to state aid. Um, and eventually he received his teacher certification, and he's ESL certified. I know we have a high need in this state based on the research I do for ESL certified teachers. He's now currently a teacher in the same district that he graduated from. And not too long ago, he shared a story that he gave a training on how to use technology in the classroom, and one of his former teachers was actually in the training. And so it, that just goes to show that this, I also heard that there's a need for high school labor and for more teachers teachers, there's a shortage. This is like something, such a rich resource um, for the state that, that I think it's a no, for me, it's a no-brainer, and hopefully for all of you, it's a no-brainer as well. So thank you so much for listening today. Thank you very much. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good afternoon, uh, Brad. Nice to see you here. Well, uh, I'm here on behalf of Olneville Neighborhood Association. I uh, represent around 700 families uh, in Silver Lake and have for us well in um, so we do have, oh, uh, we, oh, we are aware of the problem of uh, undocumented students here in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island uh, welcomes a lot of immigrants and welcome a lot of children to, that have been detained at the border as we speak. Dorcas Institution is in charge of this, and the Catholic Archdiocese is as well uh, is uh, relocating these children within Rhode Island. Well, and uh, well, this bill is essential to be passed because the state of Rhode Island is in the top five states that invest in education, and an average of one hundred fifty thousand dollars is investing every child from the first day he starts school till high school graduation. So, and then we have these arguments of saying they cannot attend college. So all this investment that we have done for $150,000 in a child education, it will cease because they don't have access to college. And it is important to understand, like she said, they're not receiving financial benefits. They are paying for the classes. They are providing for themselves. They're not receiving any sort of financial help from the state. So it's not a financial burden, as many people say. It is a surplus for the for our higher education system. So we have, as I have noticed, uh, Mr. Gordon said that we have 
12,000 undocumented uh, children born out of undocumented immigrants in Rhode Island. Well, that number represents 10% of our population in Rhode Island. So uh, we should do better if that's the case on on uh, on creating better school, better school system. But just that uh, he loved to think uh, create numbers. But here, uh, our 750 families that we have registered in the Oneville Neighborhood Association are supporting this bill. We love the idea, though, that all our children will have access to college regardless of their immigration status. All of these families own homes, they rent, their, they are Rhode Island citizens and residents, and we think is a fair thing to do. And as we have heard in the past, it is the right thing. It is what Rhode Island needs. Uh, like she's, like the lady here said, for the last two hours, we've been hearing the lack of trained people, the lack of work skill that we have, that we're suffering. And now we're denying access to college, to, uh, to uh, like Mr. Gordon number 1,200 undocumented students in, 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 in within Rhode Island school system. So it's a significant number, and we should really pass this bill and, and stop creating uh, different classes of, of, of or sort of segregation and discrimination against those who are our neighbors, who are our children's playmate through all their high schools and, and middle schools. So thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. Um, I called all the names on here. If there's someone I didn't call, if they wanted to call. All right, how many are there? Could you please state your name so we can write it down, please? Yes, of course. Put, make sure the microphone's on, okay? Hello. Oh, okay. Um, hello, I'm Yuruska Ordinola, and I am a senior at the University of Rhode Island, and I am undocumented. I arrived to the U.S. when I was eight years old and soon, and, and soon found Rhode Island to be my home. I entered the public school system, which allowed me to go to a semester elementary school and enter an advanced program at Nathaniel Green and then into classical. I was always encouraged to pursue my education and essentially fell in love with academia. Um, after graduating high school in 2011, uh, I was placed, I, I soon uh, fell at a loss because I could not afford university. Uh, so I was placed as an international student in many of the universities that I uh, had applied to that senior year. I was only able to enter URI because of DACA in 2012. Um, I will be graduating uh, University of Rhode Island this May with two degrees in honors um, and a completed honors degree as well. Um, I have paid my way uh, through school by... Uh, applying to private scholarships and my out-of-pocket money. I have worked very hard to get where I am now, graduating after four years um, at URI. By uh, supporting this bill, you're giving students like me the voice to pursue their education. You're acknowledging students like me who called Rhode Island their home, that they too have a voice where they call their home. I am not asking for easy, and we are not asking for a free pass. We are asking for a possibility to pursue an education and make our futures a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Hanata Modis. Um, I'm an undocumented student from New Jersey, um, and I'm here. I'll, I'll say a little bit about my story, but I'm here to highlight some of the stories that haven't been heard because of students that can't be here today. Um, I am an exception in a way that I'm attending Brown University now as an undocumented student. Um,
right after high school. I graduated also in 2011, but I worked for four years because New Jersey didn't have in-state tuition at the time. So I'm pretty non-traditional, much older than my classmates. Um, and in 2013, we were able to pass in-state tuition in New Jersey. It was a youth-led um, fight, and we were passing. We passed it through Governor Christie, a bipartisan bill, uh, which was really impressive. Um, so, if a state like New Jersey can do it, um, they have much, uh, I would say, uh, harder politicians to convince. I don't see how a state like Rhode Island, who's a lot more forward than New Jersey, can't do something like this. Um, I. I was able to graduate community college and also got private scholarships, and now I'm attending Brown University. Um, but there are not many of us in this situation. Um, most of my friends are still undocumented and have just continued in the workforce. And the workforce is not the workforce that you would like to be um, after you get a bachelor's degree, right? It's the workforce working minimum wage jobs um, as really talented students um, who are just not putting their talents um, to use. So ultimately, we're creating an underclass of really talented minds that could be used to move the state forward. Um, and I hate to see Rhode Island not go towards this um, alternative path, which is to move, first of all, the economy forward with the contribution of these brilliant minds that could have a potential hap if they have the opportunity to do so, um, but also not to, like Aspar said, uh, create this divide. Um, and uh, I just to touch a little bit on some of the things that I heard from the, the counter arguments, um, a gentleman, I believe he's not here anymore, um, said that, it's, it doesn't make much sense because students who would receive this education can't work afterwards. But I read the bill, and it's very similar to all of the other bills from the states. I, I'm assuming that it was um, mirrored from other bills as well. Um, and most of the students that qualify for this do qualify for DACA. So you're going to be giving in-state tuition to students that can work um, for the most part. So it's not going to be a waste, uh, per se, speaking economically um, and speaking in, like, returns and an investment. Um, second of all, um, in terms of an affidavit, um, who will take care of something like that? So in my uh, community college, it was a really easy process. The Office of Student Enrollment just had us sign an affidavit promising that we would become a citizen once we can and have that process too. And that's such a silly thing to do, right? But yeah, you do it. Of course, you want to become um, a citizen and finally get the rights um, that you deserve um, after giving so much to whatever state you're in. Um, so I just wanted to counter those arguments. I wish he was here to hear that, but it, the processes really shouldn't be something that um, y'all are thinking about um, in terms of inhibiting you to support this bill. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. That will conclude the hearing on 7374.